Well, good day to you all, wherever you may be, and a warm welcome. Um, it's a great pleasure to be talking about uh, a subject as important as economics with justice. What I'm going to be talking about is based on the 10 week course that the School of Philosophy and Economic Science offers on the subject of economics with justice. We've been running these courses, in fact, since 1937. And during that, during that time, the lecture notes have changed um, hundreds of times, probably. But in another sense, what we have now is a continuation and development of what was begun all that time ago. Many people have contributed to, to this uh, process, and I'd like to begin by paying tribute to them, and in particular to Mr. Leon McLaren and his father, Mr. Andrew McLaren. In 1879, Henry George, an American economist, published a book called Progress and Poverty. My hope is that one day it will be possible to have a different book called Progress and Prosperity. And what we mean by prosperity in the school is not just physical, uh, material prosperity, but uh, prosperity in all forms, cultural, artistic, intellectual, spiritual, emotional, and with that prosperity, freedom. Again, freedom in all its forms. And hence the title of this lecture, Freedom and Prosperity for All. Any country, you could say, has two jewels, namely its people and its land. Together they produce wealth and all that is good and refined about life. And so we're going to um, consider these two jewels and we'll be using um, a diagram which we've uh, had in use in the school for as long as anyone can remember. So if we can have the diagram. Um, the purpose of this diagram is to indicate how wealth, how prosperity actually is produced. Uh, and for the time being, I'm talking uh, here just about physical prosperity, because if we want everyone to be prosperous, then it's necessary to understand clearly where that prosperity comes from, how it comes into being. So we'll be returning to this uh, diagram uh, on a few occasions during this talk. Um, but for the time being, we'll take land, which uh, is on the right-hand side of the diagram. And by the word land, what is meant is the whole planet, the towns, the cities, the oceans, the minerals under the land, everything. A moment's consideration leads one to the conclusion that land is essential in the production of wealth. The clothes that we wear, the houses in which we live, the cars, the bikes, the buses which transport us, the computers with which we are connected with this event, all of these things come from land. And another moment, of another moment of consideration leads one to appreciate the generosity of the land and of nature. Um, the next picture is uh, from an orchard at uh, Waterbury, which uh, some of you will know. Uh, this picture was taken in January of this year. It's an apple orchard, five acres in size, with some 950 trees. And in a few months' time, it will look like this. It will produce uh, anywhere between 30 and 50 tons of apples. And so it's an extraordinarily uh, abundant process. Now, the obviously essential part played by land in the production of wealth has been obscured. And regrettably, I have to say, it has been obscured deliberately. I mentioned Henry George's book, Progress and Poverty, in, uh, published in 1879. 
Uh, this was an enormously popular book at the time. In the Western world, it was second, it was uh, the most widely read book uh, after the Bible. Simplifying it, what Henry George said is that any particular piece of land is given an extra value by virtue of the society which surrounds it. For example, if there are good educational facilities, transport facilities, medical facilities, and the like, all these things add value to that piece of land. Henry George said, because that value comes from the presence of society, some of it at least should be returned to society. Now, this was a threat to wealthy, large landowners. And so what was uh, organized is what now is known as the neoclassical school of economists uh, from the late 19th and early 20th century, centuries. Land was lumped together with capital. And so it no longer existed as a primary cause of production. And because it no longer existed as a primary cause of production, the need to return any of the value added to society, to that society, was also eliminated. It was and it remains an extraordinary sleight of hand. However, the value and importance of land in the production of wealth is well illustrated by the way that large landowners have acted over the centuries, both to acquire land and to hold on to it. Guy Shrubsole, in his uh, book published last year, Who Owns England, uh, recounts the late Duke of Westminster a few years ago being asked if he could give any advice to young entrepreneurs as to how they may succeed in modern day Britain. His reply was, make sure they have an ancestor who was a close friend of William the Conqueror from 1066. Now one may think that was said in jest, but uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, if we can look at our next uh, picture, this is uh, one of the previous uh, Dukes of Westminster. Um, this is in uh, London, in a place called uh, Belgravia. Uh, Belgravia and Mayfair are the, uh, at the top end of the London property market. The values, the rents are enormous. And the Grosvenor family, that's the Duke of Westminster, it's the same thing, they're synonyms, uh, own a considerable part of this uh, part of London. Now, if we look at the back on the next slide, the back of that uh, statue, there's a plaque and it says, the Grosvenor family came to England with William the Conqueror and have held land in Cheshire since that time. And indeed more than uh, in Cheshire. But it's a remarkable statement. A thousand years, uh, the best part of a thousand years, uh, holding on to that land. The tenacity is remarkable. So I want to talk about some ways in which that has been achieved. Uh, and just to repeat, the purpose of speaking about this is to underline the importance of land as a primary cause of wealth. And this is why uh, some people have held on to it for so long, for a thousand years, or the better part thereof. One way this has been achieved, um, regrettably, is the uh, manipulation of the legal system. Since about the 14th century, the Court of Chancery effectively became a landowner's court. It was used to facilitate the avoidance of taxes, of dues, 
and to facilitate the transfer of assets after death, and in particular, the transfer of land after death without interference by law. Shakespeare referred to this when he said, this sceptred isle is now bound in shame with inky blots and rotten parchment deeds. A second way the law was suborned was by means of private acts of parliament. From about 1600 to about 1900, uh, somewhere between six and eight million acres of England uh, were enclosed by private act of parliament. Now I should explain that a little bit. When I say enclosed, uh, this was common land, uh, which was owned by no one, or in another sense, owned by everyone. But uh, uh, individuals during those centuries uh, used acts of parliament to expropriate that land and to claim uh, private ownership of it and to exclude those who lived uh, on and from that land from it. Uh, so this was um, in many ways a devastating movement which uh, swept through this uh, country over a period of centuries. More recently, offshore tax havens have uh, been used to uh, facilitate in various ways these large land landholdings. Now I appreciate I'm talking here and giving English examples, uh, but in uh, many ways, the features which I'm talking about will be applicable uh, in other parts of the world. The details will differ, but the features will be uh, similar. Another thing which has been done has been to uh, disguise the ownership of land um, to make it as difficult as possible to trace who actually owns land. Uh, it's extraordinary to relate, but there was a register of land created in 1086 with the Doomsday Book. The next register was over 1800 years later in 1925. Uh, for a hundred years prior to 1925, there were uh, various efforts to um, ensure that uh, a register was made up so that it would be possible to know who owns any particular piece of land. And eventually after a hundred years of trying, in 1925, that was done. As I say, the first time that effort was made since 1086. However, a hundred years on, or very nearly a hundred years on, the process of registration is far from complete. And even where it is complete, it still remains easy for uh, landowners to hide behind uh, shell companies or trusts. And so the disguise continues. The idea seems to be, if you're afraid of somebody Taking, taking, taking something away from you, it's better not to let them know in the first place that you've got it. So these are some ways in which um, the great landowners have acquired and held on to land in this country. And as I say, it'll be similar. Uh, the details will differ, but the, the general features will be similar elsewhere. I mentioned the Doomsday Book. In uh, 1086, some 200 Norman barons owned 50% of England. They were the henchmen of William the Conqueror. Now it is estimated that approximately 25,000 people own 50% of England. Out of a population of 56 million, that is a minuscule proportion. 
So land is a primary cause of wealth. This is understood best of all by those who live and have lived for a long time off the fat of the land. Now, returning to our diagram, on the left-hand side, we see work. Um, people working create wealth. Uh, again, one might have thought this was self-evident, that people are a cost of, uh, are a cause of production, not a cost of production. But nevertheless, accountants and economists persist in treating labor as a charge. Uh, wages appear on the debit side of company accounts. In the end, the effect of this is to uh, dehumanize people. So I want to give an example of uh, people working to create wealth. It would have been possible to choose uh, any one of a number of examples, but we're going to go with the French Huguenots from the 17th century. Uh, the Huguenots were given, was the name given to the French Protestants who uh, in the 17th century were persecuted in France uh, for their religious beliefs. This came to a head in uh, 1685 and many of them fled from France. A lot went elsewhere to Europe, others to South Africa, the West Indies, to the Far East, and also to America. Now it's a generalization, but uh, they were hardworking, skillful, law-abiding, family-minded people. And from nothing, they tended to prosper and they tended to bring prosperity wherever they went. The School of Practical Philosophy in New York has uh, a place where they use for retreats, for residential events uh, in upstate New York. And it's close to a town called New Paltz. And in the late 17th century, 12 Huguenot families settled in New Paltz. This is a painting of what it looked like in those days. Uh, the Huguenots tended to work as farmers, artisans, merchants, uh, traders. They were well known throughout the world for their skill with wine, with silk and olives. So this was in the late 17th century. A few decades later, they were building houses like this, uh, which you can still see. So they obviously, uh, they obviously prospered. One American author wrote, France had opened up her veins and spilt her best blood when she drained herself of her Huguenots. And everywhere, in every country that would receive them, this amazing strain acted as a yeast. So this is just to illustrate the obvious fact, as I say, that given the chance to do so, when people work together, when they work together well, they create wealth. It's not a cost of production, but a cause of production. So if we come back to our uh, diagram, at the bottom, we see natural law. This is where philosophy and economics meet. Here we may elevate our considerations from, the me from merely physical prosperity to something much greater. Natural law uh, we take as the law which applies to everyone, regardless of color, race, or creed. And it is the law which draws the best out of human nature. So I'm only going to take uh, three examples uh, for this purpose, the first of which is truthfulness. Every society, every tradition uh, that one can think of supports the importance of truthfulness. 
when people act with integrity, with honesty, with authenticity, we see people at their best. Conversely, if they act uh, dishonestly, mendaciously, with duplicity, uh, it is not a great sight to behold. Corruption is a curse through many countries of the world. With corruption comes suppression and with suppression comes violence. So truthfulness is an aspect of the natural law. Another example is patience, constancy. The farmer is well advised to patiently follow the seasons of nature. Likewise, a business is well advised that if it's based on solid foundations rather than just seeking a quick profit at every stage. So patiency, constancy are examples of the natural law. And thirdly, not stealing. I mentioned the house which the school has in uh, New York. Um, I've had the pleasure of going there many times and I stay in a, a smaller house uh, away from the main property. And I've never had a key, I've never locked a door. There's never been a thought that anyone would steal anything. I hope I'm not tempting fate, but it's a great uh, freedom not to live under the fear of stealing. So these are three examples of the natural law. And we come back to our diagram. Uh, at the top, the point of interaction. This is where the two jewels meet, people and land. And the conditions at the point of interaction will be determined by the extent to which the natural law is observed. If it's well observed, those conditions will be helpful and propitious for human happiness and human development. If the natural law is not well observed, the conditions become much more difficult. The opportunities available to people become far fewer. We're going to, in a moment, uh, watch a short film um, from one of our tutors, Anne Rappin, who is in America. A few years ago, she worked at a uh, refugee camp in uh, Jordan for Syrian refugees. And uh, the purpose of the film, it's a pre-recorded film, is to uh, illustrate what the conditions at the point of interaction are like at a refugee camp. So uh, the film lasts about five minutes and I'd like to introduce you to Anne. Hi. My name is Anne Rappin, and I have been very lucky to have had the opportunity to observe humanity in the very basic, yet extremely complex environment of refugee and displacement camps. There's so much to say, but I will focus on the points of interaction between the people and the conditions over a few different themes. Managing health is a frustrating situation for all involved. Camps spring up in dusty fields in the middle of nowhere and are very crowded. It is difficult to maintain sanitary conditions. Diarrhea and viruses are common and people still have whatever health condition they had at home. Health services are offered in the camps, but the doctors are likely from a different country and might not speak the same language as the patient. Medical supplies and medicines are limited and anything serious needs to be managed at a medical facility outside the camp. But getting there will involve taking permission to leave the camp, a long walk to the main road, and paying for a taxi to the hospital. So a lot of people just don't get the care that they need. They try to ignore the issue and rely on home remedies as long as possible. So this picture shows my colleague being carried out of the camp. He had back pain and went to the camp doctor who couldn't understand what was happening because he had no equipment. I provided some paracetamol from my backpack and our team carried him out. 
Everywhere around the world, people seem to cling more tightly to their culture when it feels that it's at risk of being diluted and when the normal societal structures are no longer in place. Camps are no exception to this. A family that I knew in Zatari camp was offered resettlement in Canada, which is a rare opportunity. Most of the family was really excited and the kids were gonna, they were gonna go to school, real school. There were gonna be jobs and better housing. The patriarch, however, turned the opportunity down. He was already worried because he couldn't control his sons well in the camp. And he couldn't even imagine how he was going to raise his daughters in the Western context without them losing their culture and values. So they stayed in the camp. Maintaining law and order in any situation where people can't meet their needs is a challenge. In the camps in Jordan and Northern Iraq, a system from home redeveloped. It's a system of self-appointed leaders who claim responsibility for a small geographic portion of the camp. Some of these street leaders uh, really do look out for the people under their domain, but the majority seem to look out for their own family. In most cases, anything that people want to do outside their tent needs to be approved by the street leader, often for kickbacks or favors. So for example, uh, each family might need to give a little bit of the food that they receive at a distribution to the street leader in exchange for him informing them that the distribution was happening. And we tend to frown on things like this, but really everyone is just doing what they can to feel some sort of control over life and to ensure that their families have what they need to feel comfortable. Education is disrupted for everyone of school age. Primary and secondary schools do get set up in camps. But in Jordan, for example, the curriculum was Jordanian and that felt inferior to the Syrian refugees. So when I would ask boys why they weren't going to school, they would often say it was because they were waiting to go back to Syria and finishing study to finish studying there or because they wanted to try to earn money to support the family instead. But if kids didn't attend the official schools in the camp, they weren't eligible for the, journey, the Jordanian national exams, which meant that they would have no proof to their level of education. The lack of employment is a fascinating aspect to watch play out. Um, refugees, are usually not legally able to work in the country that they flee to. And so initially what you see is people trying to sell whatever little thing that they can, like these kids in the top right picture who are selling cigarettes to the police on the other side of the barbed wire fence. As aid organizations get set up, they try to take on refugees as paid volunteers for projects, projects like picking up the garbage. And that's what you see happening in the photo on the top left. So in this scenario, you might have a group of people who work for five or 10 days to receive a little bit of payment. And then the group gets changed to new people to spread the benefit around. And then very slowly, some people are able to reestablish the trades and services that they had practiced at home. So cutting hair and selling odds and ends like what you see in the picture on the lower, the lower picture. So in all of this, what I found overwhelmingly obvious was the extent that these conditions are interconnected. Without employment, there isn't a way to support a trip to the hospital. And without health, it can be hard to work. You can't get a job unless your street leader approves. And when conditions are so basic, education just doesn't seem that important. But at the same time, culture becomes even more important because it provides structure to life. So these triangles that make up our point of interaction aren't isolated. They're more like an array of triangles making up a nice arabesque pattern.
Thank you very much indeed. Um, and we can see in a situation such as that, the conditions are difficult. The opportunities available to people are extremely limited. But it doesn't have to be like that. For a number of years, I've had the uh, great uh, privilege of going to India to meet a supremely wise man uh, called Sri Vasudevananda Saraswati. This is a picture of him. On one occasion, he gave a description of what a, soci what a society based on economics with justice would look like. This is what uh, he said. Firstly, it would be honorable, it would be dignified, it would be noble. Um, everyone would be treated with honor. When people are treated with honor, they tend to respond in like fashion. Noble perhaps seems a rather old fashioned word, but it's nevertheless a good word. So this is an honorable society, a dignified, a noble society. Secondly, he said, without cruelty, cruelty to people, to animals, to the earth itself. Cruelty may be intentional and callous, or it may be indifferent uh, and careless. So it's necessary to be awake. Thirdly, he said, a society with wisdom held in high regard. Plato, for example, said, it's better to follow the advice of one wise person than a thousand unwise people. He gave the example of a ship and said, it's better to uh, be guided by a wise captain rather than by the whims and desires of all of the crew. Fourthly, such a society would be self-disciplined. The people would be self-disciplined. It's self-discipline which allows anyone to excel in what they do. I'm often astonished uh, to learn about how athletes and musicians and the like, how extraordinarily self-disciplined they are in their practice. And it's that which allows them to excel and which can allow anyone to excel in their chosen field. So a society based on economics with justice will encourage and nurture and cultivate that self-discipline. And with that, people become accomplished. Everyone has talents and abilities. When those talents and abilities are realized, they are fulfilling, they give purpose to life. They allow people to live a full life. And it's best when they live a full life in a way which benefits everyone else as well, which isn't to the detriment of others. And then lastly, Sri Vasudevananda Saraswati spoke about uh, there being a generous spirit towards all. He referred to a Vedic uh, statement, may all be happy, may all be free from disease, may all enjoy well-being and none know misery. Whether that's a practical proposition or not is an interesting subject for debate. But at this uh, stage, what's being underlined is the generosity of spirit. In the pandemic, we've seen so many examples of people helping each other, communities helping vulnerable people. Uh, uh, that's been beautiful to see. And it's because we want everyone to be healthy. We want everyone to enjoy well-being. So this was the kind of society that um, was uh, described by Sri Vasudevananda Saraswati. This is a society uh, based on economics with justice and philosophy. 
Now, it's one thing to give a utopian description for a society. But in school, we have tried, notwithstanding imperfections, over the last 60 years to create such a society. If for no other reason than to show that it's possible uh, for people to live like this. And my hope is, my most uh, earnest wish, is that everyone may enjoy the world of philosophy and economics with justice, that everyone may experience freedom and prosperity. And this really is what the subject is about. So those are the thoughts I wanted to um, share on this occasion. Uh, so thank you very much. So thank you all very much. Thank you for attending. Um, we've got uh, 557 people participating and uh, another 100 or so who registered who will um, see this uh, in the next uh, couple of days or so. So it's um, a delight to be uh, meeting, albeit uh, remotely, with uh, so many people. So thank you all very much indeed. Farewell.